So now I'm, I'm going to focus specifically on Mali, and I'll be frank, it's because I know this place well. It's a, a place I've been in and out of for the past uh, 25 years, um, which allows me to kind of look more in depth at what happened there. Okay? So, um, and how this Chinese Green Revolution narrative influenced the response. Okay? So, interestingly, Bamako, Mali, the capital city, did not experience food riots, okay? But the Malian government was extremely nervous in 2007, 2008, okay? So uh, Mali did ban exports of grains, okay? So you did have an issue where you had a lot of traders from coastal countries who are coming in and they're trying to buy up grain in Mali, okay? And, and the government was very concerned about that. I don't think it really stopped it, okay? People were paying bribes at the borders to get the grain out. But you could argue that that is a de facto export tariff, okay? So it probably did slow down the exodus of grain, okay? The other thing that they did is they completely removed import tariffs. So import tariffs on food had been reduced during the structural adjustment years. There were small tariffs left, and then those were completely, completely removed, okay? In addition to this, there were other ways longer-term strategies for, for responding. And I want to talk about two of these, okay? And the first of these, um, the Chinese are not directly involved, okay, in the Nurika Rice Initiative. Um, but I think their example inspired this, and it's actually the Americans that are more heavily involved in this, this first uh, response, okay? So, um, this is a map of Mali. This is showing you where um, uh, most of the intensive rice production occurs in this purple area. This is where most of the capital city's rice production comes from. But in the southern part of the, of, of the country, which historically is the breadbasket of West Africa, you are growing sorghum, millet, maize, groundnuts, okay? Um, and it's a food surplus area, and the big cash crop is, is cotton. Okay? <coughs> Um, and the Prime Minister of Mali in 2008, um, because of this concern about uh, global food prices, launches a massive uh, initiative to um, plant Nurika rice in the southern part of the country. Okay? So um, this is just an image of typical landscape in southern Mali, okay, you have seasonally flooded areas that are in the, in the lower lying areas where traditionally women, and it was, rice was a women's crop, women would go rice, okay, but in the gentle slopes, the upland areas, you would grow <coughs> sorghum, millet, maize, and cotton, and peanuts, okay. This is a topo sequence, it's a profile of the landscape. I apologize for the indigenous soil types, but I'm just trying to give you a sense of how rice was grown in the lower areas, and uh, you have these other crops which are grown on the slopes, okay? Um, not much surplus rice is grown in southern Mali. Women grow it, and it's, it's a kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's a special crop for weddings, for celebrations, okay? The major food crop in these areas, like I said, are these other coarse grains. What the prime minister wanted to do was convert a lot of these sorghum and millet fields to rice production, upland, dryland rice production. So he launches this huge initiative in the spring of 20, uh, 2008, uh, February, March, April, this period. Everybody, according to the interviews I did in the agricultural ministry, are pointing out that this is highly problematic. Okay, they don't have the Nerica rice seeds, they don't have the inputs, okay, uh, the, the, the fertilizers and the pesticides that you need to do this, but the Prime Minister, who's angling to be the next president of Mali, and we're having an election in this spring of 2012, is really staking his political fortunes on this initiative, okay? So, the extension folks go out, they disseminate seeds, they disseminate inputs, and they work with men. Okay, so they want men to grow rice, and rice is a female crop in this part of Mali, okay? They end this campaign, okay, and it's, 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 it's declared an amazing success, okay? Um, and from, 
all I can tell from the interviews I did, so no government minister, uh, people in the government on record would say that it was a failure. But oftentimes you'd do an interview, you'd walk outside, and then you'd get a second story of what happened. <laughs> and so off the record, as well as based on observations that I did in the rural areas, it was a massive failure. Okay? So how can you report a great success when it was a massive failure? Well, two things happened. They did have a bumper crop up in this rice growing area up here, the traditional export-oriented rice growing area. So you had a big crop, and part of that's attributed to the South. The other thing that happened is when the extension staff went out, they picked the best farmer in each village who had the highest yields, and then they extrapolated those yield results to everybody that, that grew rice. So as one of my ag economist friends has told me, if indeed this was the success they claimed it to be, then there are some secret grain elevators out there somewhere that hold all this rice that was, that was supposedly produced. But the thing to keep in mind is that this was important internally politically. The prime minister needed this to be a success to ensure that he would be a viable candidate in the presidential election. But also externally, okay, um, Narika Rice in uh, agronomy circles is the next greatest thing. It's the silver bullet that is going to save West Africa from the food crisis. So I think um, there was a lot of interest externally in this being a success. Okay? And um, the, the Extension Service and USAID and some other prominent actors were, were quite involved with this. Okay? So second example that I want to um, focus on a bit, okay? Um, and this is in this major rice producing area, um, which is north of Segu. I don't know if any of you here have spent much time in West Africa. Um, but this area is called the Office du Niger. And it has a very interesting history, okay? Which dates back to the French colonial period. So um, the French were very keen, okay, in the 1920s to replicate what had happened with cotton production in Egypt, okay? So they wanted to have um, irrigated cotton production. So um, they built a, a dam just downstream some, from Segu in a town called um, Markala, and they diverted water out of the Niger River into a series of perimeters, okay? Um, they initially focused on cotton. It was a massive fa failure, basically because it was economically unsustainable. The costs of producing cotton were so high that it could not be sustained. So they very quickly switch over to rice. Okay. Um, this particular scheme was built at great human cost. Okay. They didn't. There weren't enough local people to construct the dam and the rice perimeters, so they brought in a lot of labor from. Um, Burkina Faso, um, who subsequently stayed, okay, but there was, um, it was forced labor, there was pretty significant loss of life, um, and, and from an ecological standpoint, you were taking about 70% of the flow out mm -hmm. of the river, um, which creates huge problems downstream for an inland um, delta area known as the um, inland Niger uh, River Delta. Um, so. You know, you gain this production within this irrigation scheme, but then you lost production downstream, which was the traditional rice producing area. Okay. So, in 2008, the uh, Malian government signs a deal with the Libyan government. A 50 year lease of 100,000 hectares within this Office du Niger. So this is the area we're talking about. This is that inland delta that I talked about. This is where the dam is, where you're diverting water up into these areas. This is a blow up of this. And this is the, the, the um, project we're talking about. So it was a Libyan sovereign wealth fund, okay? We don't know how much money was exchanged, but it's a 50 year lease for that land. These, these are two other projects um, uh, north of there, but. But these are more kind of traditional development projects, 
focused on increasing rice production, but more for domestic consumption. Okay. This project is about producing rice for export. Okay. So it's a Libyan sovereign wealth fund, but the implementers of the project are two Chinese firms. Okay. So like I had mentioned previously, China is very active in Mali on a lot of construction projects. They have a tea production project, they have a sugar production project, but along with this have come all these Chinese private sector operators, and they then become the implementers for other types of development projects. So um, the, um, the, there's a Chinese firm that's building the infrastructure, and then there's a Chinese firm that's bringing in the improved seeds and training people how to produce uh, rice using this particular package, this Green Revolution approach to, to improve uh, food production. Okay. Um, in order to kind of revitalize and increase production in this area, roads were built and one of the largest canals was built in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's about 30 meters wide, it's 40 kilometers long, so it's an extension, another canal off of this Office du Niger project. Um, in the process of building the canal, there are a couple of issues that come up. Okay? One is that there were communities in the way, so they needed to be moved. But also, this is an area of intensive animal husbandry. So when you build this canal, you interrupt the, the pathways of the, the, the um, transhuman pastoralists uh, normally move. Um, and then there's the big issue of diverting water. So remember, we're already diverting 70% of the Niger River's water, and now we're going to divert even more. And this has serious consequences. This is a blow up of this area downstream, the inland Niger Delta. So this traditionally is where rice was produced in Mali. Um, this is, there's a lot of good scholarship that, that suggests is this is where African rice was initially domesticated. There are two major kinds of rice in the world, African and Asian rice, okay? So this has a long history of rice production, and it's also a site of incredible um, agrodiversity, agrobiodiversity in terms of different types of, of rice varieties. They also practice recessional agriculture. So, you know, the floods come in around June, uh, the water level starts to go up, it starts receding in, in December, and as that water recedes, you can plant on the residual moisture as the river recedes. Okay? Also, as the river recedes, there's a plant known as burgu, which is prime f uh, fodder for animals. So in the dry season, there's a, there's a, a, a pastoral that's come into this area, they graze their cattle, and then they'll also they'll leave this area when, when the rains return. So this whole set of kind of fishing and agriculture and, and, and pastoral livelihoods is being threatened by increasing diversion of water um, uh, upstream from this site. So you may be wondering, and I have wondered intensely, what's going to happen to this project since Gaddafi is no longer in control of Libya and he's in hiding. And the best thing I can tell is that the agreement was signed with the Libyan government. It was not signed with Gaddafi. So um, it, it simply transfers. Okay? So this is still a part of the Libyan portfolio and the food is still destined for uh, Libyan markets. Now what's interesting is the way this particular project has been sold to the Malian people. And it's very much about improving food self-sufficiency, um, getting infrastructure investments, and teaching how people how to use so-called modern agricultural practices. So this is a quote from the Malian agricultural minister. Our concern today is to modernize agriculture, especially rice cultivation. To do this, we need a lot of resources and a lot of land. We cannot give a, a tractor to a small producer who would use it on two or three hectares. That would be a waste. So large-scale agriculture, a big emphasis on, you know, you need resources to build this infrastructure to improve rice. And these Chinese firms are, you know, involved in this, in this implementing this particular approach. 